Good evening, Huyen Aunt. Great to have you all here with us again. Wherever you may be this morning, this afternoon, this evening, welcome. The SAF is chatting again. The SAF Gesels. Yeah, time for exploits to be shared. Um, The gentleman I have on the other side here uh, came to my attention a few months ago. A photo or two was circulating on the outer web of a Dakota with very, very little in the line of control surfaces, tail control surfaces. And uh, Kuss, Kuss, our own Kuss, sent me on the photos and, and the contact details. And here we are now, a few months later. Uh, I have Colin Green on the other side of this line. He was uh, pilot commanding the, the Dakota on that day. And uh, I'm going to say good evening. Welcome here, sir. It is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, do relate where, what got you to the SAF? Where do you come from? Tell us a bit about your uh, childhood and, and how you managed to land in the SAF and take it from there. Thank you very much for joining us. Right. Thank you very much, Fossi. Uh, my name is Colin Green. Uh, I joined the Air Force and uh, got to the rank of captain. Um, I grew up in Boxburg and I went to Christian Brothers College uh, for my schooling. Uh, in matriculated in 1979 and in 1980, as we uh, all did in those days, we got called up and uh, I got called up uh, and I eventually well, landed up in the military police uh, as a call-up. Um, I proceeded to Pretoria and joined the military police school just outside Vonnebuam Airport. And I uh, did my basics there. And because I had already applied to the Air Force uh, to uh, be a pilot, um, I was waiting on the people to let me know to go to the Air Force to do the selection board. And unfortunately, the um, military police lost me. It just shows you how good the policing was in those days as well. And uh, we were up in the bush just north of Victoria. And uh, the more I told my corporal that I was supposed to go to the Air Force Selection Board, the more told me that I was jibber cutting. And uh, they sort of abandoned me. Eventually, they found me, rushed me off to the Air Force uh, Selection Board. And I was on the last selection board of that year, and uh, I did pass everything. But unfortunately, the selection board was uh, fully booked for that intake. And so I had to return to the military police for the rest of the year. The following year, I applied again, and this time I made it uh, to the selection board. And again, passed all the, uh, all the tests and that, and uh, I was given a the opportunity to become a pilot. Um, first of all, we had to join PF, and uh, I went to the uh, Air Force uh, Academy, where you had to become an officer first, or officer's training. Uh, it was about a three months course. After that, we were posted to Donata, and we started to fly the Harvards. That was about a nine month uh, time period of training on the Harvards. Um, and also doing the ground school and learning all the facets about aviation um, and other type of lectures. I remember the one lecture, it was called a advanced aerodynamic lecture. Uh, they were held in a blacked out hall. And in those days, there was no video screens or um, computers like today. And these um, lectures were basically about the aerodynamics of an aeroplane and what makes it fly and what makes it move and the reaction to everything. If you do one, it's going to react on the other side as well. They were the most boring lectures I've ever met, been in. And in the dark also, you found yourself falling asleep. But this was a, a key training exercise or training thing that we had to do. And in later life, this thing uh, saved my life. And I'll come back to that a bit later. But anyway, Donato was uh, quite good fun. We flew the, the Harvard uh, around. They were 
painted orange in those days, and we wore orange overalls, so we were highly visible to the instructors. And wherever we went, we had to run. And we were pretty fit by the end of that period. Uh, once you had gone solo, we had uh, navigation exercise, aerobatics, and all the facets of flying. Uh, once we had all passed, we unfortunately lost quite a few pilots at that stage. Um, the standard that the Air Force set was very, very high. So you had to be on the top of your game to get through that course. Once we had qualified, uh, we were all sent off to three different training schools. You either went to Potchefstroom to fly a light aircraft or Bloemfontein to fly helicopters or Longabon to fly jets. At that time, I uh, wanted to fly jet pilots, and uh, so I opted for Longabon. We uh, all jumped down to Longabon and arrived there. Longabon was uh, quite a different place to Donata. Um, nice silver aeroplane, go fast, oxygen mask, G suits, and all that type of thing. It was uh, again back to the uh, ground school, which we learned about the aeroplanes and uh, all the systems there, how they operated. And eventually we got into the training. Uh, the speed adaption from a uh, Harvard to uh, Impala is quite different, it goes a lot faster and uh, the only thing is that it only had one control that you had to use to make it go faster and slower not like the old Harvard with a pitch and a mixture and all those type of things a little bit easier to fly and uh, but the, uh, the the high altitude flying was was quite exhausting and the high g-forces that you did incur um, one thing I felt with my body is that uh, not everybody can adapt to g-forces and uh, I lacked a bit of that adaption uh, and I struggled with the high speed uh, g-forces so at the end of Longabon uh, the training um, my instructor approached me and he said that he could see I was battling and he suggested that I, I move um, lines again and uh, one of the lines they opted for what I, I could opt for was transport and uh, so I took that, that line, and four of us from uh, that uh, pilot's course uh, after wings landed up going to transport. Uh, once we finished uh, at Longabon, we all went back to Donata. We had our wings parade. We all passed out and uh, all went off to the different flying schools. Um, I was posted to 44 Squadron in Pretoria, to the Dakota and DC-4 Squadron. I was there for about three or four months waiting for the course at Bloemfontein to start. Um, we all went down to Bloemfontein and we did the DAC training course there. It was about a three-month course. Uh, I taught you how to fly a DAC, uh, how to lower it, um, how to do all funny things in it, uh, strap down. You became a workhorse of the Air Force. And uh, that was quite an enjoyable time. Uh, after that, I was posted to back to Longabon, and I was at the navigation school where I was flying uh, the DAC for the navigation uh, pupils. So we used to fly once a week on a Friday. We would get airborne, and all I did was sit and uh, fly the airplane in a straight line and try and get the, uh, the navigators lost. It was quite interesting flying over the ocean and doing some uh, strange routes. After three months, uh, I got relieved of that and I was posted back to my um, senior squadron at 44 and arrived there and I became a, a DAC uh, line pilot and uh, basically started flying all over South Africa. Um, as a co-pilot, you had to do everything for the, uh, the commander of the airplane. You had to plan the routes, make sure the weights was right, the fuel was right, and... Uh, he would arrive just with his headset. You had this massive big bag with all your uh, maps and paraphernalia for navigation in. And I felt like I was like a pack horse, but uh, you learned a lot. They had some very good commanders there and they, they taught you a lot about uh, flying, about loading of airplanes and operating out of strange uh, airfields, a lot of dirt runways, small ones, going in and out of... Uh, big airports uh, like uh, Jansmuts Airport and all the big airports around. And uh, yeah, we 
spent a lot of time up on the border. Um, when I first got to uh, 44 Squadron, um, our bush tours were always uh, in Grootfontein, and we were stationed there. And then every day we had to fly from Grootfontein to Ndangwa, and then only start to do the day's work. The uh, deck in, on the border at that time was mainly uh, there for transportation of, of uh, personnel and rations, mostly wet, wet rations, meat, vegetables, uh, milk, and, uh, and bread. And we would fly from Ndangwa to the outer uh, army bases of Inanna and Congo and uh, Pua. And these were nicknamed the Rum Run. And uh, we would load up all the, the stuff in the aeroplane and also post. And we would fly, um, climb up over the airfield, because in those days the, uh, the SAM-7 threat and the uh, people around the base used to take uh, firing at you. So we'd take off and spiral up over Ndangwa until we get to 10,000 feet. We would then set off uh, on our line towards the, the next military base of uh, either in Congo or in Yana. Once you got over the base, you then spiral down, also protected by that base's uh, firepower. We would land at these small little dirt runways and sometimes uh, maybe a tar runway. Uh, we'd pull in and uh, unload all the army people, the, all the paraphernalia, uh, post and all the rations. We would then load up with personnel and postage going back. We would then basically take off again, climb up, sparring up over the over the uh, the airfield, and then set home a uh, route off home to back to Ndangwa. And uh, between that, we did a, a, a lot of uh, dropping of paratroopers. Uh, that uh, the parabats were in in the base at Ndangwa, so we used to take them out at night and uh, drop them. If the choppers had found a, a vehicle, that they would stop at night, especially in dark moon. Uh, we would then come in and drop a string of parabats, and they would then uh, move through the fields and uh, get to the vehicle and then surround it and apprehend, hopefully, the terrorists that were moving at night. Um, it was quite good fun flying at night uh, with the paratroopers. Um, I don't know how they ever jumped out of an airplane into pitch darkness. It was quite uh, frightening for me to watch them. But... Uh, I think at the end of the day, it, uh, it was a good operation and uh, Lunar Ops became very popular with the Parabats and with the pilots because we got a lot of night flying uh, experience. Um, other things that we did with the DAC is uh, Casavax. A lot of uh, people would be injured up at the bases. We'd have to fly in with doctors and they'd pick them up and fly them out. We did supply dropping, um, and eventually uh, we moved from Hurtlifendain uh, back or all the way up to Ndangwa, and we were stationed full-time at Ndangwa with two decks or a few decks with two deck crews. And uh, our intensity of flying became a lot more. We were flying um, a lot more missions, supplying a lot more bases, and moving a lot more personnel around the bush area. Uh, pamphlet dropping, we would go out at night with letters uh, or pamphlets to drop uh, over the whole population and ask them to report terrorists and also terrorists to give up because we'd, if the army had caught one, we'd take his photograph, write, uh, get him to write a letter, and then we'd drop his down the borderline and hopefully his mates would pick it up and then see he's being caught. So deterring them from, from infiltrating and uh, giving their brain a bit of thought about what they were doing. The, uh, the intensity of the war effort up there, um, the DAX, as I said, weren't uh, involved in attacking of, of, of anything or because of the aeroplane. As I said, the, the, gun, the gunship, we, we mounted a, a 20 millimeter cannon, the same one that we had in the choppers, the Alouettes. We mounted in the tail of the aeroplane and the doors. We took the, both the, the cargo doors, doors off the aeroplane, mounted it. It was hydraulic controlled. And uh, 
the engineer would sit in the tail and the pilot would sit in the front and we'd try to coordinate uh, the firing position so the commander of the aeroplane would then uh, bank and point his wing, the end of the wing, at where he wanted the guard to fire. And he would look from the back of the aeroplane to the same reference point, the point of the wing, and then he would know where we were talking about. And then he would let a, a blast or two go. Um, we started operating with the, the Kufut um, guys up there as well. In conjunction with the Alouette helicopters, they would be at, at about a 500 feet above the the uh, Kufut guys, and we'd be up at a thousand feet, and we would support the helicopters by flying further out on the line of advancement uh, that the tours were taking, and we would then fire into the bush uh, and try to slow down the the terrorists enough that the either the helicopters or the Kufut guys could catch them. Uh, it worked pretty good, and uh, a lot of success was was made. Um, but before, because we were flying a, a little bit higher, we couldn't actually see much movement, but we did deter them and they did slow down and eventually be caught by the, the ground troops. The flying of a DAC uh, can be a, a, quite a boring task. It's quite a slow aircraft, but pretty fun to fly. Um, it flies very uh, stable and uh, the people call it the Vomit Comet, I suppose with the altitude that we're flying in, only to eight to 10,000 feet. The, the thermals in the heat of the day was quite intense. So the aircraft would shake around a bit and jump up and down. And the only thing that we had to stock it with was a lot of uh, sick bags. And uh, after a flight, uh, a lot of the people would have to get out the airplane and take their little baggie with them and have to go and dump it in the nearest trash can. Um, that's why they call it the Vomit Comet. Uh, but it was an impressive airplane to fly. At the time I was flying it, uh, the aircraft was over 50 years old, and I actually flew the, the, the deck on the border on the day that it was 50 years old. We did a fly past over in Dangwa and at Oshikati, the two decks that were on the border. And at the same time, uh, at Swatkorps in Pretoria, um, 44 Squadron with uh, the Cape Town Squadron and a few um, civilians. They flew a huge formation of DACs uh, over Johannesburg and over Pretoria. And uh, that uh, uh, photograph of, from the ground of all those aeroplanes up there is quite impressive to see all those old uh, aircraft from pre-World War II all flying still and uh, doing a good job. Uh, if I go back to my my first piloting days, what uh, gave me a, a lift up to fly was my father was a glider pilot. So I was hanging around the little airstrip outside of Alberton every weekend, and I'd help push the airplanes around. And uh, eventually my dad said, okay, you can have a ride. And uh, I remember climbing into this glider. It was a two-seater old German airplane uh, called a K-7. And I sat in the back seat. I must have been about 10 years old. And the instructor got in the front seat. And we had a winch, a long piece of cable tied to a, a, a big uh, winch uh, powered by a V8 Ford motor. And uh, they would rev up this motor. And then they would pull you along the ground towards the winch about a kilometer away. And then as, as you got flying speed, you'd pull back on the stick. and they, it would be a kite effect and you would be shot up into the air. And uh, the very first time I did this, uh, we ran along the ground for a couple of meters. And as we pulled back on the stick, the cable broke. So we had to have a quick emergency landing there and everything was safe. We repaired the cable and went back to the start and did it again. This time we got airborne and uh, it was quite late the afternoon. The thermals weren't that much around. And we just got to the end of the runway and when the, the instructor turned back to go on the downward leg, uh, we suddenly hit sinking air and uh, we had to land out just across the road from the flying club and uh, to dismantle the whole aeroplane and drag it back into the, the airfield is quite a mission. So my very first flight was a bit of a, a um, gun ho type thing and uh, I landed out in this field. Anyway, um, 44 Squadron was quite an enjoyable place to be. 
We had a lot of good pilots, a lot of old pilots uh, dating back from many years ago, and they were quite good characters. And uh, we had some good people there, and a great, uh, great boss there. He was, he was great. Um, during the war up in Ndongwa, um, is that we had two crews there, so we were always operational, flying basically every day, and. The DAX, because they were flying um, under the, the 15,000 feet, we were in the zone of being hit by a SAM-7 missile. The SAM-7 missile was used by the terrorists. Um, it is a infantry weapon uh, carried on the back. It's a long tube with a, um, a handle on it that, that operates it. It's a rocket launch thing. And its uh, envelope of of, um, of operation is up to fifteen thousand feet, and within about a five kilometer radius of the operator, um, the missile can only be launched from the. Uh, in other words, the aircraft must fly over them, and then they fire it from a rear position when your exhaust pipes are facing backwards, or a jet engine blast uh, up the tailpipe. Um, it was designed in the, in the 60s and a, wasn't a very effective weapon um, as uh, the guiding thing. It was a, a first sort of generation type uh, um, system. It had a three and a half kilogram warhead and basically it had a shrapnel casing. So when the missile came up uh, and followed the heat source of your engine, or your jet pipe, it would fly up to that area and then it would detonate, shredding your, your engine or your surfaces with, with uh, shrapnel. Um, if it could go further up the tailpipe, it would, but most of the time it, it exploded in the back end or of the, a jet engine. Um, to counteract that, the Air Force uh, painted the, the Dakota uh, flight services with a special um, paint that didn't reflect light or sunlight. Um, and then the engines had a cooling system on the, where the exhaust pipe came out of the engine. They called it a, a Strela mod, which was basically looked like a, a 20 liter paint bucket. Um, and inside it, there was a, a number of venturis to speed up and slow down air, as well as uh, uh, fins that um, disperse the heat source uh, as widely as possible so that the, the eye of the uh, missile wouldn't lock onto the hottest point. So you're dispersing your, your heat. And I believe they worked pretty well. Um, in all the time that we, we flew on the border, we didn't, we saw a couple of smoke trails that would pass us and we would say, okay, right, that's definitely a SAM that had been fired at us. But because it was always behind us, we, not, we didn't notice them all the time. Um, but I worked out that uh, we used to fly three or four rum runs a week, consisting of, of four or five legs, plus other legs, plus other passengers, and other uh, um, flights that we had to work, use. And I believe that 44 Squadron flew in, in the region of, of over 10,000 sorties up there. And not one of the airplane was struck until I was, I was hit by that SAM-7. Um, we also used to zigzag, you know, it was between the, the two positions or the two uh, air bases. We would then fly slightly left off course or right off course. Uh, but when you're only flying a 20 minute leg, uh, you can only do left so many times and right so many times. And we used to zigzag and try everything to confuse the ground people that you know where we were going and whatever but you still have only a small uh, area to work with so the potential of being hit was always there but i think the the, um, the aircraft were, were well protected by the systems and uh yeah we we had some interesting times up there um during the the the, the heavy fighting I think the most um, rewarding flights that I ever had was uh, basically going up late afternoon into Angola 
the choppers with uh, Kasevac, um the people that were injured from deep in out to the, uh, an airbase or a, a cut piece of strip in the middle of nowhere. We'd had a, a runway made for us. We would then land, pick up all the Kasevacs with doctors, and we would then take off on last light and fly back to Ndongwa and unload all the, the Kasevacs in the hospital where our, our medics who were world famous for, for battling, you know, battle damage repairs, they would fix up our, our, our troops. And I think any troop that went out there that knew that if anything happened and he was still alive, the chances of getting back to a hospital were very, very good. First of all, by a helicopter, and I must take off my hat to those helicopter pilots. They were brilliant, flying in very tough conditions and uh, doing a very, very sterling job. And if you look at the the award presentations for uh, bravery in the South African Defence Force, I think most of the guys that, that got uh, Norris Crookses and very high uh, rewards were mostly chopper pilots. They are definitely outstanding and they deserve whatever they got. They really were great guys and, and absolute fearless. Um, another thing that we used to do up on the border is uh, when the reconnaissance people were deep into Angola, they would task a DAC uh, to go and do a supply drop. We uh, had a, a roller system in the, in the one DAC that acted like a conveyor belt. And uh, we would strap pallets with parachutes uh, and have uh, basic rations, food, um, fresh food as well, as well as uh, water and ammunition. We would then set sail deep into Angola, often flying two and a half hours from Ndangwa all the way into Angola and find a, a special forces um, persons on the ground at night and flying a deck at night at low level with only an old compass and a stopwatch is quite, uh, quite difficult. And we became quite good at it, uh, reading the wind and getting into the areas where these guys were. Once we got there, we would make contact with them. They would then flash a, a small beacon of light. We would come over and throw all the pallets out and uh, then we'd turn and return back to base. And often when we would do this, the, the last pallet to be put on the airplane or the first one that went out the door was a special pallet. It had two army hot boxes on it. They were stainless steel. And uh, the first time I did it, I asked him what they were. And he said, no, this is a dish of steak, egg, and chips for the guys on the ground. And the other one was cold, and it had uh, ice and cold beer in it. And I always remembered flying out, and the first uh, pallet that fell, I think it was the first one that was opened and eaten and drank. And many years or years ago, I lost... Um, I went to, last year, I went to Australia uh, to visit my daughter and I met up with a whole lot of South Africans, um, ex-military and Air Force guys and a lot of Australian ex-military people. And I did this, the same uh, talk that I'm giving you now and I told this exact story. And at the end of the time, I was having a beer with the guys and a gentleman walked up to me and you could, when I noticed him, you could just see that that whole body language. He had uh, gray cropped hair, a bristle moustache, and that really like mean look in his eye. And he came up to me and he just stuck out his hand. And I said, hello, Colin, my name. He said, good, thank you for the beer. And that really made my heart, you know, pound faster that, uh, that this guy, you know, enjoyed the fruits of our labor and, you know, getting that type of stuff to our troops. It was, it was rewarding. Very, very rewarding. Um, if we come back to to the, the fatal day, the 1st of, of May uh, 1986, uh, I was up on the border um, doing an, a two-week ops tour. We always did a two-weeks op tour, um, and then we were relieved. We had two, two crews on the, at Ndangwa. In this particular tour, 
Um, when I asked who my co-pilot was, they couldn't tell me. They said, no, the co-pilot's already there. Um, he, he was at Bloemfontein, uh, and he didn't have any work to do, so they sent him up there to do a bush tour with me. Anyway, I didn't ask any questions. I got in the aeroplane in the flossy, and off we went. And when I got to Ndangwa, uh, it was a mate of mine from my um, pupil uh, pilot's course, Mark Moses, and uh, Mark was um, – in a, on my course, unfortunately, he had a, an accident at Potchefstroom and he broke his leg. So he was about six months behind us, but he got his wings and eventually um, got onto Dax. And uh, so it was his first bush tour with me. And uh, yeah, we had great fun. We laughed a lot because he was quite a hilarious guy, naughty as hell. And uh, one of the, the biggest things what Mark could tell was the story. Uh, he was flying a Kudu one night doing sky shout and, and pamphlet dropping. And uh, the main Air Force command base was at Oshikati. And the commander, Colonel Lord, wanted to speak to the, the pilot because he was uh, doing something wrong. And he got on the radio and instead of calling up the call sign of the, um, the airplane or the mission sign, he came on the radio and all he said was, Moses, this is the voice of the Lord, and it's been a Air Force tradition that those little that little sentence was was hilarious to everybody, and uh, yeah, Mark was was quite a character. Um, we did a, a two week bush tour together, as it on the the morning of the first of May. Uh, we woke up. We weren't due to fly. It was a Wednesday. The rum runs were basically flown on a a Monday, um, a Thursday, and a Saturday. So the Wednesday was, uh, we weren't going to fly. But anyway, we got up in the morning and went through to the ops briefing room where all the pilots would get together with the um, intelligence people. And they would then give us a briefing of what's happening up on the border, restricted areas where we weren't supposed to fly. And on that morning, uh, the ops officer got up and he said that, um, all the uh, terrorists have been with, withdrawn or were been withdrawn from the operational area. And he said the SAM units were also being withdrawn for training. And it stuck in my head that morning, but it didn't really make any difference to what we were going to do and how we were going to fly. We had our set ways of flying, and we were quite confident in our ability to avoid them. Uh, or to deter them from hitting the aeroplane. Anyway, we just got back to the bungalow and uh, we got a telephone call from the ops room telling us that we had a, a special flight. We went through and it was a task to go to Komandangwa, go down to uh, Apua, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from Komandangwa, uh, on a westerly direction towards the coast. Um, and we had to go and pick up a, some passengers there. That's all we were told. Anyway, myself and Mark and the loadmaster, uh, Ian Welsh, we uh, got the airplane ready and uh, we took off. We were empty. And uh, so Mark took the controls and he flew a low-level route for an hour and 15 minutes. Beautiful route, low-level. There's not a, a mountain in sight. And... Uh, Eventually got to um, Apua, we landed, and uh, we waited there for about 15 minutes, and then suddenly two Puma helicopters came in uh, from the western side, and they landed next to the deck, and the doors opened and outboard a whole lot of uh, generals and the admiral of the Navy. Anyway, uh, I was told to take these guys and uh, ferry them back to Ndongwa, where they would catch a um, VRP airplane and fly them back to Victoria. And uh, the Admiral, uh, Vice Admiral Sinekong, was the chief of the of the Navy. The General was General Kat Lindbergh. He was the chief of the Army. And a whole lot of other uh, lesser generals. And the Air Force officer was uh, Commandant John Church, uh, chopper pilot from 16 squadron anyway put them in the airplane 
briefed them about what the flight was about. And anyway, we took off and I was on the uh, flying in the captain's seat. Mark was in the co-pilot seat. And uh, we took off, we spiraled up again over the, over the uh, airfield. And then we set off uh, zigzagging down this, the middle line back to Ndangwa. And we had just crossed the, um, the tar or the dirt road that runs from um, Vintuk all the way up uh, to Ruakana. We just crossed the road and we were at 10,000 feet with the autopilot on. And suddenly there was this massive explosion. And at first, um, the aircraft just bucked up. The tail was coming up. The nose went down. And uh, I thought that an engine had, had gone. The DAX used to often blow a, um, a heli coil on the engine, pop the, the spark plug out. And you'd also get this explosion and uh, oil all over the place. You had to feather engine and then go home on one engine. And I instantly turned to my side, checked my engine, and Mark turned to his side and checked his engine, and I grabbed the controls. But that, by that time, the nose was pitching up almost into a vertical um, situation. And I grabbed the, the autopilot, shut it off, um, reduced power on the, on the, on the, on the uh, engines, and then pushed the elevator forward. And when I pushed the elevator forward, there was just no elevator control. It had basically disappeared completely. My feet were on the rudders, and as I pushed the rudder pedals, again, no response to any of the controls. And by this time, with the engine power down, the nose started to drop. So we applied power again, and the same thing happened. The nose of the airplane pitched up again. By that time, I knew that it wasn't the engines. The airplane was, uh, engines were purring perfectly. Um, and by this time, the, the uh, loadmaster, Ian Welsh, had already uh, appeared in a cockpit, and his eyes were as big as saucers. Because he was sitting at the back of the airplane, and all he told me is, Captain, I can see air, I can see the sky. And then I realized what it was, that we had been hit by a SAM-7 missile. It was the only uh, weapon that was capable of hitting us at that height. It couldn't have been a, a um, RPG. We were too high. And immediately, uh, you started to think, how are we going to control this monster? Uh, it's unstable. Uh, it's not reacting to any of the control surfaces. And we're still a long way from home. And my brain started to tick very, very quickly, almost like a computer, I suppose, in those days, to try and fathom out what to do uh, to save us. And eventually we, we cut most of the power almost down to idle. The airplane dropped its nose, and we were in a descent, and with applying enough uh, forward pressure on the, on the uh, elevators, I managed to stabilize the airplane, but we were still descending at a uh, only at about 100 knots, where the DAC used to cruise at about 125, 130. We had to reduce speed to 100 to keep stable, but again, losing altitude. Um, we made a mayday call out to Ndongwa Air Force Base. Um, they then asked us where we were. We gave them a position and what we thought was a problem. Uh, they immediately scrambled two Puma helicopters from Andangwa. One was a air crash crew with doctors and uh, medics on board, and the other one had a, a stick of parabats that if we had to go, go down or crash, they would then secure the area, and hopefully survivors would have been treated by the doctors and taken back to Andangwa. Uh, it was Nice to hear them coming out. The, the tower told us they were en route. We then, uh, as we were, we were descending down, and eventually got to about a thousand feet. And I said to Mark that it, we, we've got to stabilize flight now because if we don't stabilize flight, we're going to either fly into the ground in a gradual descent, or we're going to pitch up again, nose up, and we're going to stall the airplane and then crash. And at that time. That dull uh, 
room at Ndang at uh, Donata, dark room with those boring lectures, almost came into my brain like a file fax. And it was, my brain was filing through every lecture I had. And eventually it stopped on a page that said centered gravity. And we realized that if we could move the passengers forward um, over the centered gravity and put them all against in the cockpit and into the, the flying of the, the, the cockpit area, we would change the center of gravity and then we would be able to control um, the pitch of the airplane, uh, get it into a downward thing and then apply power and then balance out the airplane. And that's what we did. We moved the passengers with the help of uh, Commandant John Church. He was he put his helmet on so he could hear what was going on. He plugged into the intercom system and we moved the passengers slowly forward. And some of them were right behind the pilot's seats. There was a navigation area there, and they were sitting on the floor. And eventually, I got the the balance of the airplane right with the center of gravity, as well as a balanced um, speed of 100 knots without losing altitude. The direction control uh, was limited only to the ailerons. So we had to turn the airplane with the ailerons uh, luckily, we were coming in from from the west towards the east, and that was the, the runway direction of Ndangwa was also in the same direction. So we didn't have to worry about turning the airplane that much. Uh, as I said, the, the, up, the pitch and, and descent of the airplane was the most important thing. And as I said, the, the rudder was completely gone, and the elevators, there was only a very, very slight uh, response to them, but we got the plane stable. Uh, we then got uh, found by a civilian helicopter pilot. They were doing a pipeline inspection, and he came next to us, and he just said that he can't believe what's happened behind us. He said uh, he, had, he couldn't stay long, and he then uh, pulled out. The two Pumas then found us just other side of Oshikati, and uh, we had opted to fly a little bit northwards so that we could pick up the Oshikati um, Ruakana Road, which is a tar road. And we, I was planning that if we got into more trouble that we could at least ditch onto that road and with pumas coming up and ground troops in the area, we'd be safe uh, from any terrorists trying to get at us. The puma helicopters found us and uh, the first one gave us a... a uh, sight or intelligence of what they happened to the airplane and it was quite lucky that one of the DC-4s from 44 Squadron was at uh, Ndangwa that day and the commander, uh, Captain Bill Good, um, he always had a camera handy. He jumped on the on the one Puma helicopter to give us uh, advice, being a DAC pilot as well. So he came out with the helicopter and uh, he got on the radio and then he gave me quite an uh, intensive briefing about what was uh, left of the aeroplane. And uh, he, he said to me, first of all, the rudder is no longer there. The rudder was completely destroyed. And he said about 80% of the ailerons, uh, of the so elevators were also completely destroyed uh, by the missile. Um, Dakota's... Uh, Flight controls are made out of aluminium as a frame. Then they are covered with a um, Irish linen, which is quite strong. They then paint it with a, a paint that uh, hardens the the um, the fabric like a drum, and then they paint it with uh, paint for the aircraft for coloration. So this thing doesn't have a lot of uh, hardness or anything. So when the uh, Sam Seven um, warhead blew up. It hit the, the uh, rudder at about halfway up the rudder, and that is when it exploded, blowing is it the rudder completely off uh, the, the control rudder. The main uh, fin of the airplane was still there, but damaged quite badly with the shrapnel, and then the elevators were 80% gone. Um, we had a look around the airplane. Uh, he said that you can see a lot of holes in the, in the fuselage, which we could see from inside. Uh, luckily, nobody was hurt. Uh, nobody picked up any, any damage from the, from the explosion. 
Uh, they checked the undercarriage to see if that was okay. It looked all okay. Um, so we just carried on flying. And with myself and Mark, we decided that uh, we'd fly it in until the last second and we put the undercarriage down and uh, as quickly as possible land the airplane. We decided to keep the speed up to 100 knots uh, and not uh, put flaps down because we didn't un uh, uh, realize uh, what if we had slowed down, if we would lose control services and lose control. So we kept the speed up at 100 knots and we did a flapless landing. Um, all Air Force pilots were trained from Donata to Langebaan. Everywhere we went, we were trained to land an airplane uh, with not using flaps. Um, you come in a lot uh, shallower than a normal um, landing and you have to increase the speed uh, so that you keep on um, getting lift on the wings and you come in pretty fast and at the last minute you put the airplane down on the runway. And uh, because we decided that um, we didn't want to try to fix something that we couldn't fix. So we, we were in stable condition and we were flying the airplane. So we decided to fly the airplane as it was. Anyway, we came in over the, over the fence and uh, we put that airplane down. We greased it onto the runway. And when I hit the runway, my heart just was overjoyed that we had we had overcome a, a real terror situation and uh, we rounded out at the bottom of the runway and uh, I sat in that cockpit absolutely exhausted and uh, Mark got up and I remember him saying, Colin, keep the pose. He was a pretty uh, funny guy and he got up and he collapsed. His legs were also so wonky from, from the drill and eventually we got out the airplane and all the generals and uh, the Navy uh, Admiral were lying on the, on the top, also exhausted just from being passengers. And uh, the guy, uh, the Admiral got up and he gave me such a, a great hug. Uh, and he was just so thankful that we, that we managed to get them all back safely to and on with. The uh, ground crew come along with the, the, the tractor. We hitched up the, the aircraft with the, the towing boom and we, pulled it back onto the, the main hard stand in Dongwa. And every aircraft fitter, every pilot, every parabat, every body in the whole of Ndang was, was standing on the stop walls, all cheering. And it was a really, really great uh, feeling uh, to be able to arrive back with that airplane in such a bad condition and to have saved everybody. And I think, uh, yeah, people say that uh, you were brave. I was never brave. I was just thankful that I, I could have flown that airplane and understood how to fly it and landed it safely. That was all I was interested in. And uh, I wasn't brave. I think most pilots in the Air Force with the training that we had could have flown the airplane. It was just a matter of finding the right combination of controls to work out the stability of an airplane. And I think the training of the South African Air Force pilots was the best in the world. And it proved itself many, many times with jet pilots doing almost the same thing, coming back with badly damaged airplanes and landing them at the airfields and saving their lives and a lot of other people's lives and the chopper pilots as well, coming in with badly shot up airplanes. They all, were the best. We were the best of the best. Anyway, the once we had landed and we had uh, got all this uh, cheering and, and back slapping, we had to go to the uh, the medics. We went there for a checkup, and uh, they each they gave us a pull each just to calm us down because we were shaking like leaves by this time. The adrenaline was incredible, and. Uh, the guy said, take this pull and go and lie down in your bed for half an hour. And anyway, I took the pull and uh, I went back to the bungalow and I just laid down and the telephone rang. Uh, it was the bush telephone. Normally, ops phoned you on it and they would you know, give you instructions or whatever. And I went and answered it. And it was my wife. My wife had uh, 
gone out with a, a boss to a meeting, and on the news, the civilian helicopter pilot had radioed somebody who said, and the chain of reaction was so fast that within half an hour of us landing on Dongwa, my wife knew about it from the daily news at 12 o'clock. So she phoned me just to see if it was all right. And uh, she just had that feeling it was it was us, not the other crew. And uh, yeah, it was quite incredible to, to talk to my wife so quickly after the incident. Uh, we had a, a, a bit of a rest and a lie down. And then... Uh, we woke up and myself and Mark decided that uh, a survivor's party was, was due. And uh, not having any money in our pockets, we only had a couple of rand for a couple of odd drinks. We decided to go and bump some money from the, the pay office. And we uh, we asked for our, our danger pay. We, you had to wait, wait two weeks for danger pay. We were only there a week, but uh, the kind lady knew what we had done. And so she advanced us our week uh, danger pay up front. And that night we went to the, the long bar at uh, Ndangwa Air Force Base, the longest pub in the Southern Hemisphere. And we rang the bell and put all the money in the in the big jar and we had a party of notes. And uh, it landed up the whole base back at our uh, uh, prefab or our bungalow building. And uh, we're in one big bra and quite a party. It was, it was incredible. And uh, today I sit and think about that that incident, and it really was uh, something that I can tell my grandkids and hopefully their kids one day of of how we flew that airplane. And today that airplane is still flying today. Uh, they're still flying all over the world. And that actually that aircraft we we did a search the other day, the one that was hit by the Sam Seven. And we found it. Uh, most of the airplanes from the Air Force were eventually changed into turbodax. The engines were taken off, the fuselage was extended, and they put turbine, modern day turbine prop engines on them. And that particular aircraft was sold, went to somewhere in Australia, and eventually landed up in America. And when we did the search, we found it at a um, restoring uh, facility just outside of, of um, Chicago and we got hold of the owner of the of the business and uh, we said to him we understand that you've got the airplane and he said yes he's revamping it uh, for a, a company that runs a, um, a ambulance service in the middle uh, middle America in the um, Central America area and we said to him, do you know that this aircraft's got quite a good history? And uh, he said, yes, he had heard, but he hadn't seen any pictures or anything. So I sent him a whole um, email with the pictures and that. And he was quite um, flabbergasted that we could fly that airplane in such a bad condition. And one of the interesting things he, he came back with was that when they were stripping the tail of the plane to check all the rivets and to stop uh, corrosion and that, they actually found little pieces of steel and he didn't know what they were. And then when I told him what had happened, he realized that that was the shrapnel from the SAM-7 was still inside the tail of the airplane. And that airplane today is now flying in South or Central America and it's an ambulance airplane doing a good job and still flying. It's quite incredible. I think some of the funny things that happened uh, with the DAC flying and the DC-4 were the most rewarding trips that I did. Um, on the deck, uh, we did a lot of casavacs of people. That was really enjoyable uh, to save people's lives. Um, dropping paratroopers for the first time, uh, to see them jump out there and go in their wings. Uh, also an incredible experience. And then uh, later on uh, at 44, I started to fly the DC-4, which is a four-engine old airliner airplane, um, beautiful airplane to fly, um, could fit in about 60 passengers, and uh, we used to do a lot of uh, VIP flying around South Africa and onto the border. We took a lot of overseas guests to see the border and to see what was going up there. Um, and I had the, the privilege of flying the two old ladies who presented uh, Forces Favourite on a Sunday. 
uh, Tony Esme Everard and Pat Kahn. They were beautiful people and doing a sterling job up there on the border and on keeping the troops and the girlfriends and mothers in, uh, you know, in communication. It was really something special. Um, I flew a lot of um, overseas military attaches around the country, also up to the border, the Americans, the British guys, uh, a lot of South American um, uh, people also up there. It was interesting flying. And then one of the most also rewarding things is uh, flying the entertainment groups. Um, every now and again, uh, a sponsor would come along and, and get a, a senior Sainsbury dance group that a band, Eddie Eckstein, a um, couple of other singers together. And we would fly them all around the border and each night stop at a different base and they would have a, a show and then free beers afterwards. And those trips were pretty, pretty intense. Uh, good fun was at it all. And especially when you sit, you uh, flying around this South Africa, it really becomes uh, quite enjoyable. Uh, one of the funniest trips I did was uh, we got a, a task while we were on the border to go down to Vintuk and pick up a bunch of people and fly down, down to Kimberley. Anyway, we got to uh, Vintuk. And this Umpa band climbed on the airplane. And anyway, we took off. And the whole way between Vintuk and, and Kimberley, they were playing Umpa music in the back of the airplane. And we got to Kimberley and we unloaded them. And that night there was beer fish and everywhere had a great party. And I think we got to bed about three in the morning. And the next morning we got up, got back on the plane and we flew back to, to Vintuk. And while we were flying along, the Umpa band was still going, and I put the autopilot on on the deck. And it, the autopilot from Second World War is really old and, and cranky, and it doesn't work so well. And it tends to lose its its power now and again. But this trip, this autopilot wouldn't stay still. I had to keep on tuning it up, and the airplane would climb up, and then I put down, and the airplane would go down again, and then it would go up and down, and I couldn't tune it nicely. It was really not 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 playing ball. And then the guy tapped him on my shoulder, my co-pilot. He said, but Captain, look what's happening at the back. And the Umpa band was marching up and down the, the, the fuselage in the back area. They would all go to the back and then the airplane would go up and then they'd come to the front and the airplane would go down. And then they all laughed and you know, gave me the, the nod. And uh, so when we got near Vintuk, I decided that I'm going to give them my, my piece of action. And we went low level. And uh, did them a bit of a rookie ride. And I think a couple of them got ASIC. And uh, yeah, so I got my revenge at last to those guys. The DC 4 was uh, great flying. Um, I had some great uh, people I flew with. And I think the best guy that I ever flew with was uh, the commander of, of 44 Squadron, uh, Commandant uh, Hill. Um, used to call him Um Stilfis. Uh, great pilot, great sense of humor, and he looked after his pilots, and he also looked after his air hostesses. We weren't allowed to touch them. They were out of bounds, and uh, we had some great trips with him, and an uh, interesting man, a lot of experience, and I really enjoyed working with him. I think that's about all I can say about my Air Force career. Uh, I enjoyed the, the years that I was in the Air Force. I met a lot of very, very uh, interesting people. Um, I saw the development of the G5 cannon. We used to fly down to Hell's Gate down in the Tel, and they used to do the testing of the G5 cannon there. And it was really interesting to see a weapon of that caliber being made by South Africans. And still today, the technology that uh, we invented for that uh, cannon uh, is still used. It's been bettered by other people, but the the, um, the basic understanding of how to make a shell fly further just by aerodynamics of, of the shell um, really impressed me. And uh, it's, it was great to see people like that working in our Air Force and making um, our weaponry that we had uh, better than our, and our against our enemies. Uh, even though our aircraft were slightly less uh, effective against them, especially on the fighters, but the fighter guys were really great. They had good um, working systems, 
and good missiles in it. And I think uh, is it, the, it was a joy to have flown in the Air Force. We had some terrific people, uh, interesting people, and they really put their, their heart into, into flying. And all those guys that I met up there, uh, well done to you all. And I hope you all have gone far in your, in your set careers, whether it was keeping in the flying or doing something else. And I'd just like to say thank you to Fossi for inviting me to uh, have a word with you guys. I hope you've enjoyed my, my little chat and my stories about the, the DAC flying. And uh, thank you very much. And good night to you all. Colin, I want to say thank you. And, you know, uh, the one thing that jumped out at me, and you said it, so I don't have to say it. All I can I have to do is reiterate it. We were the best because of the training, because the training never stopped. As you said, you could file facts back there to something that you had been taught many years before and it came to the fore when you needed that pertinent bit of information to come. And that's because of the training. Many people have taken what they learned in the Air Force, their grounding into their civilian lives. And it stood me to good, in good stead and I bet you, you'll say exactly the same. I do say thank you very much. I'm not going to belabor the point here. I'm going to just say thank you. At any time you feel like coming back with a buddy or two or with uh, some of your, your, your squadron members to come and tell us particular tales. Oh, I, I want to say one thing about rum runs at, especially at Inanna, there used to always fall boxes of meat or used to fall out of the, those decks and straight into the SAF hands. I don't know how that happened when we were staying there for our week trips. I just don't, I can't remember how this happened, but the deck guys looked after us big time. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. confession, mm -hmm. confession. I think occasionally a case of this or that also fell out, but it was mainly the fresh meat, the steaks and the this and the that's. And the... We were making poiki costs with fillet steaks at one point. That's how much of the stuff we had. That all fell off the back of a deck. <laughs> Ter terrible, <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Anyway. No, it was interesting. Uh, I never regret any time that I spent there. Uh, as it, uh, I learned a lot. And I think today, uh, my whole life philosophy and lifestyle is still based on, on, on that type of, of ethos of, of helping people going together as a group. Uh, and that was it. We, we went and we did things together, you know, whether it was a flight engineer on the ground or a ground mechanic or whatever. Uh, a guy putting the injection pins in a seat or whatever. Everybody was there, and their goal was only one goal, and that was to do the job the best of their ability. And I really, you know, I think today of, of what the Air Force is like today with the airplanes, uh, and the, I don't know if they even can get them airborne anymore. It's just sad sad to see the, the, um, the waste and the unprofessional way that things are, are, are run. It's, it's sad to see it. But unfortunately, uh, I think money and a lot of other things are, are, are in the way. And it's sad because I don't think a lot of people are experiencing that type of, of, of life. The youngsters today, all they think about is uh, video games and, and Skyping or, or talking on their, on their systems. Uh, those days, there weren't anything like that. We, we had to have a ticky box and a couple of quarters in your in your pocket to phone your wife. Yeah, and uh, just to, to for everybody that does not know, uh, we were allowed one phone call per week on a Sunday night. Uh, you wouldn't, you couldn't get phone calls. So in your case, when you, when your wife rang. It was a special case. Uh, was. You you couldn't the the phones didn't ring daily. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't. It was literally a patchwork from Vintuk to Oshikati, from Oshikati to Vintuk, at least not to Vintuk to to Ondangwa. There was a a, a whole uh, uh, analog system 
for for that phone to ring in in your bungalow or your I cabin. I think it worked. It's something like six exchanges that you go run through to get that telephone call to me. Yeah. So uh, that, those were special, absolute. And no wonder you you'll never forget it, because uh, this just didn't happen. You didn't pick up a, a mobile and get within range and curse because you didn't have signal and that kind of thing. You got your call Sunday nights. That was it at Ondangs. If you were sitting at uh, one of the outstations, you just didn't get a phone call. Sunday nights was the only night phone. <laughs> Any case, that's beside the point. So that also struck me that it was so such a special uh, moment to be able to speak with your wife not long after that. Um, right. Yeah. So I take my hat off. Uh, you guys did a m massive job, and I do. I did know Mark Moses. I think we we, we our paths crossed, and yes, he was a naughty man. <laughs> very, 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 very. Oh, okay. May rest in peace. Yes, may rest in peace. Um, I'm going to say thank you so much. You're always welcome at Legacy Conversations at the channel. Uh, I'm sure uh, the lads are out there are going to enjoy this immensely. I did. I had goose flesh at, at times where you were speaking about trimming the aircraft with a few uh, generals helping you stabilize flight. They You put them to good use for a change. Yeah. <laughs> that time they earned this pay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they did. <laughs> anyway, before I get into trouble and one of them give me a clap against the, the back of my head at some point in time, um, I thank you very much. And as we always say here at Legacy Conversations, God bless. God bless everybody. Thank you very much.